Okay, everybody. Hi, this is Tony. Welcome to another episode of uh, Crime Pace with Bob Nick Dust. And today it's coming to you from a university grow house. I want to show you some of the interesting stuff they got in here. Lots of uh, strange uh, botanic anomalies. Okay. First off, we'll start out with this member of the cucumber family. This is Dendrocissios socotranus. Okay. Uh, from the island of Socotra. Good luck uh, trying to get over there. But uh, it's a member of the cucumber family. First thing I want to point out to show you here is remember Cucurbitaceae, the cucumber family, is a family of mostly monoecious plants. That is, flowers are uh, unisexual, okay, individual flowers, either male or female, uh, staminate or pistillate. And uh, that's illustrated for you right here. So they're individual flowers, either staminate or pistillate, male or female, but you get them both on the same plant, opposed to plants that are dioecious, where, uh, you know, the flowers are unisexual, but the whole plant only produces one flower sex. So Cucurbitaceae being monaceous is a great example to show it off. You could also look at the like squashes or pumpkins and see the same thing. So look at these flower, these flowers right here. You can see on the left, you got the uh, pistillate flower. That's an open stigma with those uh, papillosa stigma surfaces just waiting to receive pollen. You also have that swollen ovary uh, down there. You can see the stamens right there, just the uh, dehissing pollen. Okay, look, notice how different the flowers look. See that? You got tree lobes over there, and then right here, you don't got those lobes. You just got a bunch of little stamens and anthers dehissing, doing their thing. But especially, again, look at the base of the flower. Swollen ovary here, no swollen ovary right there. Dead giveaway. Next time you're looking at a squash or a pumpkin, uh, you know, go ahead and take a look at that. Now, of course, you can see this weird bastard. He's got a big trunk to him. He's a little bit succulent, and he's got, the, you know, he's got this very coriaceous texture to his leaves. Coriaceous and waxy and shit. Looks like they got a little bit of scale here. He's all dangling and whatnot. Now these can get upwards of 12, 15 feet tall on the island of Socotra where they're native. But again, you know, that's, uh, you, you, get, you probably, you know, have to pull some strings to get over there. It's, uh, you know, a little, little tricky. Not sure how much the airfare would cost, probably an arm and a leg. Uh, look, go, look, go ahead and look into selling your kids to pay for that trip. I don't see any pistillate flowers. I just see that one staminate flower right there but really when you see the, the pistolate it's a dead giveaway now I, I, many members of the cucumber family they do have more staminate flowers than pistolate flowers this is a rule they tend to have more males than females okay there you go look at that you can see there you go typical filaments with the big ass anthers on there just the hiss and pollen that's great and they get that texture of those leaves up there as well you see that Look at that, not gonna want to munch on it. But again, probably not many herbivores on uh, the island of Socotra anyway, so they you know, didn't have to work with herbivores as a selection pressure, thus affording them the opportunity to get so uh, large and succulent. Look at that nice coalescent trunk right there. And here we go, this one's a little bit more common in cultivation, another member of uh, the Socotran flora, okay? Native to the island of Socotra, this is Dorstenia gigas from the fig and the mulberry family Moraceae. Now these bastards get upwards of, you know, 10, 12 feet in diameter. And again, you got that coalescent habit, all right? Kind of like that uh, Dendrocissios, which I showed you back there. That Dendrocissios is the only member of the cucumber family to grow in a tree form too, I should mention. There's the, uh, the uh, floral structures and fruits of uh, those Dorstenias. Now Dorstenia is not a monotypic uh, genus, unlike that Dendrocissios. There's about a hundred species in this genus. Look at that. Look at the texture on the top of that, uh, that little fruit. True stunner, true stunner. And again, you could just, you know, you snip off little little parts of the branches and, and with the ship, dip them in some root hormone maybe and you can root them easy. This, this gets passed around a lot more commonly in cultivation than at the Dendrocissios. So got this uh, Euphorbia bioensis See, they get the tag. See, they get the tag from uh, Madagascar. Almost looks like a cactus, but it's not. Remember, it's just convergent evolution. I try telling you this all the time. I said this 9,000 times. You guys never listen to me. You never listen to me. Huh? You silly prick. Convergent evolution, okay? A plant, unrelated plants responding to similar selective pressures in similar environments. In this case, uh, hot and arid. Okay? And again, when you're in a hot, arid, exposed environment, you're going to be one of the only things... Uh, on the menu because there's not much uh, plant life compared to like a woodland or a, or a, or a forest or you know even a uh, just any more you know music area so there's going to be more selective pressure on you to develop a way to uh, you know avoid uh, avoid getting a knot on a lot of weird euphorbias out there 
Okay, now, now for real, Stunner, okay? Well, which you, Mirabilis, okay? Another monotypic genus, monotypic family, okay? But they got, they got relatives in a fossil record from Brazil. This guy grows in the fog deserts in Namibia. And, and plants of this species are dioecious, meaning that individual plants are male or female. Right here we got a female. She's about to be going off, okay? Not gonna get pollinated, but uh, it's been discovered that there, these plants are actually insect pollinated. There's not a lot known about this species, actually, in terms of its pollination. There's a few papers out there, but a lot of it is just, uh, you know, hasn't been studied. But you could see these, uh, immature megastroboli, because this is technically a conifer. It's, its closest relatives are in the genus Needham and Ephedra. Of course, Ephedra you'd know from the deserts of North America, as well as the some other areas in that, uh, similar areas in, uh, in Asia, in China. Look at that. You got the same two leaves, looks like different leaves, On looks like four leaves, but this is actually two, one here and one here. Same two leaves throughout its entire life. Same thing going on up here. Looks like four leaves, but they just split. One leaf, one leaf. Same two leaves throughout its entire life, and they just grow all sprawled everywhere, all messy mess, you know, tattered and beaten and whipped the shit over, you know, the thousand or two thousand years uh, of life that this plant uh, can indulge in on the fog deserts right there in Namibia. I had a friend, he was a merchant marine, he sent me some photos uh, once. He said, hey, we docked uh, on, on a coast in Namibia. I went for a little stroll. Okay, went for just a little uh, gander uh, on, you know, on, a, on, a, on land for a while to go see what I could see, see what they had. And they had these weird plants everywhere. You know about these? What are they? And I said, you rotten bastard, how could you send me these, you silly prick? I, you know, I'm so envious of, you know, he was a good guy. I meant it with love. But, you know, I just said, I'm so envious. I can't believe you do this to me. I think at the time I was, uh, you know, in Crook County, I don't know what I was doing. I was probably in the fucking Jewel Osco parking lot. But I just started crying, you know, because why couldn't I be in Namibia doing what he was doing? I don't know where the hell he is now. I think he, I don't know where he went. I don't know where he ended up, but he was all over the world doing it for a while. <clears throat> Moving on down the line, here we go. That was what with you. Oh, wait, okay, okay, hold on here. I got I to gotta show you what the cones look like once they're, I mean, this is not, this was not pollinated, so there's no seed in it. But if there was seed, you know, just like a pine cone. Kind of the seeds would be on these little bricks right there, and those little scales and whatnot, papery bricks, and then they, you know the whole thing just dehisses and they get blown all around the little coastal plains of the sands and with the shit in Namibia where they grow. And look how they grow them too. They grow them in these chimney pipes because they get really deep roots. I grew two from seed once. I kept them alive for a year or two, and then they died. I went outside in the greenhouse during the foggy cool winters we get in the bay area and they just rotted it was just hairy and moldy and it had just rotted away pretty sad but once you, if you can keep them going you know fast draining soil they actually need decent water you can probably water them from the bottom i don't know how to shit they water these but in a deep pot you need a deep pot right there you know you got to say something about flowers that smell terrible and this flower definitely smells terrible it's actually a member of the milkweed family the milkweed subfamily Asclepiodoidae of the oleander family, Apocynaceae, and this is a species in the genus Stapelia. It smells fucking terrible. It smells so bad, you know, it smells like rotten. Look, you even got the hairs in there. It looks like a piece of roadkill. Looks like a vulture should be digging into it. Okay, this thing smells so bad. I had one on my uh, kitchen window a couple years ago. They're really easy to root, too, like a lot of the succulent milkweeds are from uh, uh, continental Africa, from South Africa. Okay, you just clip one of those off, let it dry, stick it in some dry soil, you know, let it sit there for a few days. They remember they're succulent, so they got all the carbohydrates and moisture. They eventually send out roots, they root readily, don't even need hormone, and then boom, you could get a share with all your friends. Ever. It's pretty soon everyone's got nasty, filthy smelling flowers on their windowsill. I had one of these in my kitchen window, and uh, uh, a fly actually ended up, you know, just one of the shit flies that you have sometimes get in your house. You know the shit flies, right? Different from the cartoon flies, which just fly slowly in circles. I kind of like the cartoon flies, but I don't like the shit flies. that are more obnoxious ones. A shit fly had actually landed on that and laid eggs inside it, and the maggots had started to grow. But, of course, since it's a fake out, it's just producing the smells without the rotting meat. They, did, they just ended up dying. But uh, you could actually end up, you know, using these as a trap to dupe flies to laying eggs in them. And then the maggots would just die, of course. But either way, you could see it gets pollinated by flies in habitat. Flies and carrion beetles in habitat. Quite a few plants do this. 
Amorphophallus and the unrelated uh, aeroid family does the same thing. Big genus, the, the titan flower is in it, the giant corpse flower is in it, the family. But again, this that's unrelated to this. It's a monocap family, this is a eudicot family, this is the milkweed subfamily of the oleander family, Apostinaceae. And there's that nasty, there's that nasty flower. Look at that. Look at that. You can almost see, you can almost see the stigmatic slits in there like you might see on a milkweed flower. Is it? How you get in there? Look at it, and you flip it over, there's there's the petals. No, no, no decor on the petals. Petals, five petals, five sepals under there. That's it. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Okay, so speaking of plants that smell absolutely terrible, here's the king of them all, okay? Also the largest flower in the world in a genus Amorphophallus, which has quite a few dozen species in it. I had Amorphophallus uh, cognac in my backyard over there, and it just, you know, stank, smelled like hell. I walked in a goddamn yard. I thought, you know, one of the neighbor's uh, 15 feral cats they feed had died in there. Either that or it was Larry the Possum, who, you know, sometimes with possums and, and shit, those guys just drop suddenly. I don't know why they do it, but, you know, they, you know they're eating all kinds of weird shit. Anyway, I thought it was something dead. It was a, a smaller version of this guy, a sister species of this guy in the same genus, Amorphophallus. Now, this is Amorphophallus titanum from the island of Sumatra over there. You know Sumatra over there by Singapore? You know where they, they came that kid for spray painting some shit? Uh, you know, a couple decades ago. Anyway, so this is an emerging uh, flower. It's got a big corm down there. Remember, uh, 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 you got corms and you got bulbs. Corms are stem tissue, bulbs are leaves. And it's this, uh, so the corm did this for a few years with, uh, that's a single leaf. There's no abscission layer up there. Okay, that's all technically one single leaf. Did this for a few years. It would just, you know, collect energy from the sun and stash it back down in the corm. Did it for a few years till finally it did it enough and it, this, it decided it had enough energy. So this year we're not getting no leaf, we're getting this flower. And this has quite a few weeks to go, probably, I don't, I don't know, two, three, four weeks to go, but it'll eventually, you know, be upwards of five feet tall, four or five feet tall, and it'll smell like raw hell for about four or five days. And that's because it's pollinated by beetles that normally eat rotting flesh, okay? But it's still, look, at a sight to behold, okay? And it's an aeroid family. Eraceae, which remember they have a very specific uh, inflorescence structure to them called uh, the spadix and a spathe. Okay, you got your spadix in a, in a center which has all the individual flowers on it, and then the spathe is just the bract that surrounds it. But uh, look at the texture, it is too touchy, it's like rubber. It's all rubbery, looks like it's sweating a little bit, very disgusting, but also beautiful. And so, look at it, look at the texture of these. Oh my god, look at the texture of this, uh, this bract around her. Oh, that's nice. So anyway, we'll, maybe we'll come back in a couple weeks, see what it looks like. But this plant gets so much publicity already. I mean, you, you probably got one at a botanic garden, actually. You should go check it out sometime when you get a chance to. Remember, the male flowers will be up top. Female flowers will be on the bottom. Okay, and it'll be, you know, four or five feet tall. Now, let's look at the leaf right here. So this, it seems almost unbelievable that a stock that big could, could you know, sit. A plant this big could sit in such a small a path, but remember, it's just got to store energy in that corn. It's got a, a little battery down there that's right. So right now it's recharging the battery, and then eventually this will all die back, and it'll just exist in that battery, that corn down there in the bottom. Okay, and all the amorphophallus do this. My amorphophallus uh, cognac slash Riviera did the same thing. Had it three or four years, it would just send up that one single leaf again because there's no abscission, no abscission layer, you know. It's all technically the same leaf. And, and then it would do that, and then, you know, for four months it would be up there. And I just kind of ignored it, watered it, put it in the ground, and then it would die back. And then it's, you know, like I said, this year it, it did that. It sent up a smaller version of that. But uh, you get a texture of that too. Probably some uh, bio camouflage going, at, going on there. Some selective pressure to avoid being eaten that it's acquired over the last however many millions of years. There's the actual leaf itself. Quite a banger right there. I don't want to be here when that thing goes off though, because the smell is really tasty. If you've ever smelled a corpse before of any kind, it's imagine that times a hundred, and that's what I mean. Imagine like a corpse that's been sitting in a feeded body of water, uh, enclosed in some sort of airtight dome, and that's kind of what this smells like. Look, not a remorpho fell. See, this guy's just opening up shop. See, just open it. Leaves haven't even unfurled yet, so he'll do that for I don't know three, four, five months. Then he'll close up shop, die back to the corn. Right next to the coffee plant right here, Rubiaceae, which are inner petiolar stipules. Do you see the stipules? 
You know, there's that's one of the main synapomorphies for the family Rubiaceae. Okay, Cretam, coffee. Okay, a lot of good stuff in this family. Huge plant family, especially in the tropics and subtropics. But there's the interpetiolar stipule. It's a stipule that exists between the petioles of the opposite leaves. Opposite leaves, of course, are another. Uh, they can be a good giveaway, uh, as long as you got the interpetiolar stipule for the Rubiaceae, the coffee family. Look at the individual flowers here. Axillary, okay, coming out of the leaf axils. Do you see that? You got any open yet? Probably not. Coffee actually grows good as a house plant too, surprisingly. I gave my dad one, you know, I don't even know if he killed it yet or not. We don't talk because he's kind of a prick. He looks like a shorter, fatter Joe Pesci without any of the charm. But anyway, uh, you can see there's the, uh, there's the flowers. And it, of course, the little beans, of course, the fruits just, you know, come out once those flowers, they are, you know, accumulate in little clusters where those flowers are, once the flowers are pollinated. But I gave one to my dad and he, surprisingly, he didn't kill it. He's killed everything else I ever gave him. But uh, I think it's doing, he might've killed it now, just out of spite for me. But anyway, it's about, you know, 10 or 12 feet tall, growing in his greenhouse, you know, in Chicago there. You know, so they do, they, they work they work good as house plants, they do. Coffee plant is a pretty, uh, pretty, uh, you know, adaptable species. Okay, and of course you got multiple species in the genus Coffea. Anyway, another member of the Rubiaceae right here, the coffee family, and this plant is interesting not just because of the fact it's an epiphyta, not just because of the fact that it's mildly succulent. And again, remember, it's got those axillary flowers and those uh, interpetiolar stipules that members of the coffee and croton family have. This plant is uh, fascinating because of what it's uh, evolved uh, to turn its trunk into. You can see that caudiciform stem. This is what's known as a myrmecophyte. And uh, quite a few plants from unrelated families do this. They live in a symbiosis with ants as you can see right there. So this plant's trunk has been evolutionarily, evolutionarily modified uh, through selective pressure uh, to basically provide housing for ants in exchange for free bouncer service. So if a, an insect or a caterpillar comes along, starts gnawing on the trunk or whatever shit, the ants go out, you know, their home's under attack, they immediately attack it, okay? Now this plant is from Southeast Asia. It's listed as a, a critically endangered in Singapore. Uh, but, you know, interestingly enough, I saw another species in this same genus, Hydnophytum, uh, for sale at a home despot in South Texas when I was there. So, uh, a pretty goddamn, uh, pretty goddamn interesting plant there. Hydnophytum formicarium. Look at those little flowers. There's the flowers. Get up close to the flowers right there. We'll get, get a good money shot of there. See a flower and there's a fruit. That, that's the orange fruit right uh, next to it. And then there's that uh, four-petaled flower. You can see four petals in a salver form corolla, little trumpet shaped corolla, four fused petals, etc. So, you know, now Ruby AC members of this family can have four petals, they can have five petals, whatever, but it, again, you're gonna be looking for those interpetiolar stipules, see? Opposite leaves with interpetiolar stipules. You see that nice? Look at this. How's that for a cactus, huh? You, you like that, huh? A cactus that grows as an epiphyte in the Amazon. Selena Sirius Wittii. And I've seen this before. A friend of mine had this growing in a nursery in Tucson, but the whole goddamn thing was red. Just filled with those betalane pigments, those stress pigments, in response to the bright light it was getting. And this was actually the object of a documentary uh, filmed about this badass British lady, okay, who uh, decided, I think, you know, she was born like 1905 or something. Okay, the world was full of stiffs back then, especially high society, which I think where she came from. A lot of stiffs, a lot of dumb dicks, a lot of obnoxious fucking men who told her she couldn't do, you know, the stuff that she wanted to do. So she said, fuck you. And she did anyway, uh, which I like. And she went down to the Amazon and she was a painter. She started painting a bunch of these fucking things. They call them moonflowers because the, the flowers are goddamn huge. But, you know, she's a badass lady. They made, they made a documentary about it. It's called, uh, I think it's called Margaret and the Moonflower. You should watch it anyway. There's the plant, Selena Sirius is actually another large genus of uh, generally night-blooming cacti that grow as epiphytes. I was in a cloud forest in a Chiapas, Mexico once, and I seen a member of this genus going all the goddamn way up, Selena Sirius Testudo, going all the way up this tree. You know, 30 feet into the goddamn, uh, up into the canopy, and I, when I tried to pull one off, I did pull a little piece off, but when I tried to pull one off, I got attacked by ants, they were hanging out on the tree. They must have been living. It was like stuck to the goddamn. It was it was quite impressive how 
much I had to pry it off this tree tree trunk. But a most beautiful night I ever had sleeping in, in an abandoned quarry. Well, it wasn't abandoned. We got woken up the next day by workers. But in a quarry, a limestone quarry in this uh, 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 forest in Chiapas. So many goddamn frogs and crickets. You never heard a, a jungle at night. It's, you're missing out, man. And right next to that Selena series, we got another member of the Eraceae, the Aeroid family, like that corpse flower I showed you back there. See, there's the uh, the uh, spadix. See, you'd have the you typically have the male flowers up top and on the female flowers on the bottom. Spadix and a spathe, the little break that's around it. This is Anthurium superbum. Okay, from the the subtropical lowland uh, moist forests of uh, Ecuador. You can see these coriaceous leaves, very thickened coriaceous leaves. That's a beauty, man. Look at look at that thing. It's a beauty. You got these leathery leaves, all glabrous, kind of curved in to shed water because this thing just gets dumped on. Okay, kind of concave. And uh, yeah, there's the flowers. There's the flowers. Don't don't got any fruits to show you, unfortunately. But uh, if I did, you could you know, you have a gander at that. Okay, so this is a pretty good one. This is a, this is a banger, and it's an extremely rare banger at that. Not only from about, I don't know, between 30 and 40 individuals left in a wild uh, from uh, Costa Rica and Panama. This is o Osa Pulcra, another member of the Rubiaceae. You can see you get the uh, interpetiolar stipules right there uh, and the opposite leaves. Now, you can see that long uh, pendant flower, that, that uh, hanging flower with the uh, five uh, fused petals looking like a trumpet. Okay, and it's a big white flower. Okay, kind of similar to a uh, Brugmansia from the unrelated family Solanaceae or uh, Datura also from Solanaceae. Okay, now they, I mentioned those flowers because anytime you see a large white flower, it's quite likely pollinated by either moths or bats at night. In the case of Osipulchra, this is pollinated by a moth, Darwin's moth to be precise. You can see they got a little picture of it right there with that uh, long ass uh, proboscis. Uh, sticking out now you can see look up close at the flowers. You got those five Long pendant anthers. Okay. Look how long those anthers are Okay, and you can tell they're the anthers because they're all yellow and covered in pollen Then you look higher up there and you can see that it's actually the filament Remember it's a stamens go pollen anther filament and pistils go stigma style ovary. Here's the style And at the tip of that of course is the stigma now this thing uh, like I said, is is only known uh, from you know two populations in uh, Costa Rica and Panama. Probably 30 individuals left in the wild. Probably far more uh, individuals uh, in botanic gardens and conservatories. Uh, Missouri Botanical Gardens got one. A uh, National Arboretum and Botanical Gardens got one. But they're probably all the same clone. I don't know if they're self-fertile or if they're actually grown from seed. I know they are a pain in the ass to root from cuttings, but. Uh, you know, this is a good chance that this plant will quite likely be extinct uh, within our lifetime. Extinct in a wild that is functionally extinct, you know? With the way habitat destruction's going down there, forest clearance and whatnot, you know, that's what happens when you're a uh, bipedal species of primate that disregards every other, uh, every other organism in the biosphere that doesn't directly serve or benefit you. So uh, anyway, but there you go, Osa Pulcra, one of my favorite members of the coffee family, Ruby ACA, pollinated by moths at night in its jungle habitat. Look at that, a couple more amorphophallus here. Wonder what species, see that? They're growing them too close together, but it's fine. You could do that with these because they just got that corn. Remember, that leaf is gonna die in a couple months. Just sending that up to stash some energy down there in that corn, that's where the magic is. Then you can split up the corms later on, pot them up individually, whatever very adaptable species when they're in that corn state you can move them around you know take them uh take them out to your dance classes with you okay so it takes some selfies and they get in front of the mirror you know prancing around with them and shit they're fine as long as you get them back in the ground by the time they're about to send up that leaf and send up the roots again oh a nice staghorn for a nice platycerium looks pretty healthy so moving on down we're going to look at the, some of the seropegias another member of the uh, milkweed family over there with a very peculiar flower it's a vining a uh, member of the milkweed family from uh, from Mozambique in South Africa, Seropegia. This is Seropegia sandersonii. So that's that flower in there. You can see the calyx right there, the sepals. Remember, sepals are calyx, petals are corolla. You got five petals fused into this. Now, this, to show you the magic, let's go over here. Let's look at this. The bug's got to actually go in there. They got to climb inside. So this flower is an open 
those those little bricks will eventually open when they do open they look like that and the bugs actually got to crawl in there okay so the the really bizarre thing about this seropegia sandersonii is not the fact that it uh has a trap flower okay that's bizarre enough you know you get a fly to crawl in there the little hairs trap the fly because they're pointing downwards and after a few days they will they let the fly out the the really bizarre thing about this this plant the Seropegius sandersonii is what it lures to attract those flies to the base of it, okay? It produces a pheromone that mimics the pheromone produced by honeybees in distress, it gets weirder, so that the flies uh, then crawl down into it looking for the honeybee because they parasitize the honeybee. Now before we get into that, I gotta explain to you that that honeybees, when they're, you know, say they're flying around a flower, you'll sometimes you'll see crab spiders waiting on a flower, hiding out, okay, hiding beneath the sepals. When a pollinator goes in to pollinate the flower, attracted by the nectar of the pollen, the spider comes out, boom, nabs it, injects some venom, and then uh, sits with it while it dies and then starts to eat it, okay? Now, when that happens, honeybees use what's called their Nasanov gland, apparently after a guy named Nasanov, to produce pheromones that warn other bees, hey, this, is, this area is hot, I just got attacked, I'm dying, I'm going out, I'm on my way out, don't come here, be careful, heads up, you know? Basically, a, com a form of communication, all right? So he drops the dime on the spider. So when, when the, the honeybee emits those pheromones, evolution being what it is, another insect, uh, these Desmometopa flies, known as kleptoparasitic flies, which is, I mean, it sounds like something derogatory, you'd call somebody a kleptoparasite. I've known plenty of those in my goddamn life. Anyway, these flies, these kleptoparasitic flies from the genus Desmometopa are then attracted to that pheromone. They pick up that pheromone and say, oh, look, it's a free meal. This spider just killed this, this uh, honeybee. I was going to come over. And uh, now the, the, the fly is, you know, small compared to the honeybee. Can't fly off with it. Can't just outright gank it or jack it or anything. But it does. They come by and they start feeding on the, uh, the honeybee too. So it's just a free-for-all, okay? Just like pigs in a trap with the spider doing all the hard work and he, uh, the flies just coming in for a free meal. So what this what this flower does, and this is, a, yes, this is that of the flower again. This flower produces compounds that are very, uh, uh, very similar in terms of their chemical signature to the pheromones produced by that honeybee in distress because its main pollinator is those flies, okay? Its main pollinator are those kleptoparasitic flies that then are attracted to the pheromone, crawl down that tube, get stuck for a couple days. All the sexy parts of the flower are, of course, at the base of that tube. And then it, uh, you know, once uh, the hairs wilt after a day or two, the downward pointing hairs on the inside of this floral tube, then the fly can crawl out, hopefully with uh, one of the pollinia on its leg. I mean, it's, it's a really bizarre, you know, I understand almost why some of the creationists and intelligent designers and what shit what the shit, uh, you know, come up with their goofy ideas because it just seems too good to be true. But, you know, of course, something like this probably uh, occurs in baby steps. And, uh, you know, Seropegia sandersonii is not the only plant to produce pheromones, to produce compounds that mimic the pheromones uh, produced by insects so as to lure other insects that either want to mate with those insects or prey on them. But either way, very strange, okay? Very unique. But again, once you've mimicked that uh, that pheromone of the honeybees in distress. Now you got a monopoly on pollinators. Those those uh, Desmometopa kleptoparasitic flies aren't going to be pollinating anything else. They're just going to be pollinating you. Okay, and I want to show you begonias real quick. Okay, old lady plant. I love I love the old ladies. I love the grannies. Okay, they're always so nice. Okay, especially if you got an Italian grandma, they're going to feed you. Then they're going to, you know, threaten to call a mob on you, which my grandma actually used to do. God bless her. Rest in peace. She, she got mad at me once because I was making fun of some of the stuff she had in her freezer. She had like Chinese duck or something. I don't know what the fuck. But anyway, I was just roasting her and then she got mad at me and she said, you know, I can make a call and have you killed. And I, I said, you're probably right. And then I apologized and it was fine. Anyway, uh, it, she's a terrible driver, though. absolutely terrible driver. Anyway, so here's a begonia. OK, you only got two species, two, excuse me, two genera. In the begonia family, begoniaceae, okay, the genus begonia, and then another genus that's uh, endemic to the Hawaiian Islands. But the odd thing about these plants is uh, how they, you know you got unisexual flowers, okay, you got a bunch of females on the bottom, you got males on the top. But look, the the females, let's find a female with an open flower. I don't think they got any. They may not have any. No, there you go. There's a female with open flower, five petals. 
Then look at the male, four petals, okay? The reason, and, and look at this, they could be confusing too. See how that, that's a stigma right there, okay? But it almost looks like little uh, yellow uh, anthers. And that's because that's the attractant uh, for, for the pollinators, okay? Begonias, most of them don't produce nectar as a reward. They just produce pollen as a reward, okay? Because a lot of bees, you know, bees are either going for nectar or pollen in most cases so to get the bees to go to this to the first place it's, it's you know looking like anthers you got a stigma you got a female uh, sex organ a pistol uh with those the stigmas right there that looks like anthers okay and then there's of course the true anthers with the, that produce the pollen for the reward so four petals on the males five petals on the females the easiest way if you're looking at begonia flowers to tell that it's a female is look at it you got the winged ovary up right there inferior ovary subtendent flower the males don't got that, okay? So a monoecious plant, unisexual flowers, but flowers are either, uh, you get both flowers in the same plant. So unisexual flowers, flowers are either male or female, never both, never perfect, never bisexual, but you got them both on the same goddamn plant. And then of course, that very distinct leaf shape, almost succulent with the red stems and all the hairs and shit, okay? Quite a ubiquitous plant in the subtropics, very important, okay? So don't don't think of it as just, you know, the, the old lady plant for the indoor gardens or whatever the shit. It's a very important genius. No offense to the old ladies out there, and especially no offense to the Italian grandmas that might, uh, you know, threaten to have you killed uh, by their uh, mafia bookie cousin who's uh, kind of a sleazebag to begin with. Okay, there we go. There you go, begonia. Oh, yeah, so here we go. Another interesting plant from the tropics, okay? This is hibiscus schizopetala from tropical Africa. You can see it's got a pendant uh, habit here, probably pollinated by birds in habitat. But uh, this this particular species gives us a great, a great illustration of what's going on with the genus hibiscus in general. Now let's take a look at this. So you got, you got your showy petals and what the shit, you can see them, they're all fringed and lacy and whatnot, okay? Looking like, uh, you know, some sort of deranged clown costume from the 80s, okay? A lot of cocaine in that clown system, by the way. I should mention that, okay? Picked up a clown hitchhiking once in Mexico. He tried to uh, jack some shit. He was in the back seat of the truck. I tried to jack some shit out the back. I looked back and saw him, and when I saw him, he gave me this face like I just caught him with his pants down, like he had a log hanging out of his ass or something. Kind of, ooh, you know, ooh, like that. And I said, I just kind of chuckled and said, okay, this is it, you got to... Actually, I don't even think we kicked him out of the truck. I just had my friend Pete watch him, and then we ended up uh, giving him a ride to where he ended up going. But uh, it was it was endearing. It was funny. Okay. Anyway, so this is this is uh, this is what we're looking at here. This is called an androphore. All right, and it's an androphore because it's got all those uh, androesi. It's got the androesi, all the stamens, and what the shit fused to that central column. But it's also got inside that column. Now that column is few is is hollow inside, and inside. Coming out of that, that column is uh, the stigma right there. So there are the five stigma lobes, okay? And all hibiscus have that. All hibiscus have an androphore, as well as many other members of the Malvaceae, Malvoidae subfamily. They got that androphore. Very ubiquitous uh, flower trait. Very ubiquitous synapomorphy for members of the goddamn cotton family. Cotton has the same thing. Bunch of stamens, okay? Dozens of stamens fused around a central column, and you got up at the top coming out of that thing, you got... Uh, the, uh, the the stigma, okay, which can have five lobes. It can have, you know, quite a few dozen lobes in some cases. Like this thing just blew a load all over my hand. Anyway, there you go. There you go. Hibiscus schizopetala. Oh, look at this. This one didn't open yet. Look at that. That's kind of nice. Almost looks like a piece of candy. You're, you're some sort of, a, you know, a hideous tie-dye uh, design. How about that? Look at that. There you go. You got some, uh, you got some cacao. You got some theobroma. I wish, that, I wish this thing was blooming because they got the flowers are fucking tiny. Pretty strange. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Got a kick out of that. Got your kicks. Felt some shits and giggles. Chuckled a little bit. Kicked yourself in the balls. Kicked yourself in the groin if you don't have any balls. That's fine too. Throw yourself down the stairs and then, uh, and then laughed a little bit more because we all need a laugh in these fucking dark times. <laughs> these fucking dark times where everything seems to be collapsing. But don't focus on it now. Just look at the begonia. Is that nice? Okay, that's all I got for you today. Go fuck yourself. Bye.